This just looks like we had the worst slumber party. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure there's distance. <laughs> Social distance. I was, we were you can pretend the pillow is Laura. <laughs> no, usually we just have Lloyd sitting between us whenever we're watching a movie. <laughs> I was joking like when we were when this movie ended and I go like I wish there was like neighbors across the way that could have seen it and going like what are these two grown ass men doing watching? Is that strange magic they're watching? <laughs> are those fairies? <laughs> And then you came. My other favorite part about this was before we was before we started recording. I went in to go use the restroom, and I could hear you just go in the other room and just go terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I went. In, I went into the bedroom. My my wife is in there watching something else, and I was like Principal Skinner out of The Simpsons. I was like, "Well, that was terrible." <laughs> and my wife just says. Oh, I gathered from watching the first 10 minutes with you guys. She's like, she should have been like, were you even watching a movie out there? Were you just listening to like the world's worst mixtape <laughs> filled with cover songs? She's watching some Dan Brown piece of crap right now. So, oh, but okay. She's like, I needed something entertainingly bad. But I'm like, honey, we had Strange Magic. She's it's like, not Inferno, she's, is it? She's like, that wasn't entertaining. <laughs> Could have been Inferno. She, That's about a virus. She, we, we got like five minutes into this movie and she's like, this is like Fern Gully, only bad. And I'm like, honey, Fern Gully was bad. And she's like, okay, only worse. And she I'm was, like, she was out that's quick. She, <laughs> she's like, needs more Tim Curry. And I'm like, that's that's fair. So uh, this, this movie definitely could have benefited from Tim Curry. Yeah. Uh, so real quick, this is a Patreon request. Uh, so if you want, all to make, right, who's the jerk? Delta Septi <laughs> requested this to us, and I'm you. I'm so glad because not only does it give us plenty to talk about but also like but also I'm like with requests like this or when i'm like i like where your head's at in, re in requesting this so if you want to make requests uh go to uh because we got more than enough time to do patreon requests it's at patreon.com i was slash the enjoying Cinema quarantine until your ass showed up but at least so when i asked you about this though at least i told you what like the next couple were which are really good movies like dread That's and true. dread and mask of the phantasm i'm looking forward to that so go to patreon.com slash the cinema snob there'll be links in the comments and in the description believe it or not i really did kind of go into this open-minded in, in that like i didn't know anything i knew nothing about this movie except i saw yeah. the trailer once thought i don't know if that I doesn't did. look good sure yeah and I, then found out only after the fact that this was some george lucas passion project that i kind of knew from when it came out but i didn't see it when it came out because i was thinking that i was at a con when this came out like maybe like one of those four or five day ones and then i when i asked you like did this come out in january you go yep i'm like i'm pretty sure i was at magfest when this came out <laughs> you you made the guess like let me guess this came out in january i looked it up on my phone and started laughing i'm like january 26th january it is like yeah it does seem very january like so you and I have both seen a lot of bad kids movies in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So going into this, I was like, well, is it going to be like really outlandishly bad or is it just going to be kind of lame? Because I certainly heard enough bad things about it when it came out. Never got around to seeing it. And all these years later, it's not like I've heard much else about this in the past five years. So. We get, Doug and I get requests to do it every once in a while. And now I yeah. see why. And I'm like, I may talk to him and be like, we may need to delve into this one. Because it's, it's a fascinating train wreck. I was enthralled uh, by this i can see why i can see why it was the first drunk show on double toasted <laughs> um I, this was way different than i thought it was gonna be going into the movie this had a major disadvantage for me yeah. which is i have a love-hate relationship with musicals there's some musicals i absolutely love yeah. i'm not saying i hate all musicals when i don't like a musical well, you know, like fucking Mamma Mia. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it is literally just like just, just stab me in the eardrums. Just mm. do it now. Stab me in the eyes. Stab me in the eardrums, and just kick me off yeah. over the ledge. I'm, I'm out. Mm -hmm. This was definitely one. Of those. It was the opposite for me. Like when I have, I, I do love musicals, but when I have that feeling towards, <sighs> like that is when I go into something. 
not knowing it's a musical, and I, I didn't know this was going to be a musical going in. But oh, I didn't. <laughs> but when, when I went into Ugly Dolls, for instance, mm -hmm. and when they started singing in the first part, I'm like, oh man, it's, this is going to make it feel even longer. Um, with this, the reason why I didn't do it with this was because it was a jukebox musical. Because I was like, I don't know what... So it, when five minutes in, they're singing crazy right now. I'm like, where, what else do you the have on the playlist? Is, the problem is it was like 50-50, where yeah. like 50% of the time I got a laugh just because like, I can't believe Are they, they just singing Come On, Marianne? Yeah, and the other 50% of the time I was just like, shut up! That oh my god, there were way too... Even, even for a jukebox musical, there were way too many songs. It's as practically I, a rock opera. I, it's... It, you know what? I gotta show this to Doug. Yeah. Because he freaking hates Moulin Rouge. I don't hate Moulin Rouge. I'm, I'm indifferent to Moulin Rouge. I'm like, eh. I'm fine. I, I'm it. like, it's like, I know some people love it. I'm just like, yeah. to me, it's just, that's a thing that happened. I don't care. Sure. In, the, in the list of musicals, it's just somewhere. I'm like, whatever. Yeah. He, lo he like, hates that movie. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, like, run this for him and be like, do you see the difference? Because I can get through Moulin Rouge with... Some eye rolling, but I'm yeah. like, there's scenes in Moulin Rouge, I'm like, ugh. And, and, you know, I get tired of it a little, uh, after a while. But, like, this one, I was, like, five minutes in, and I'm like, out! Do you know what? It, out! There's a lot of things this reminded me of. But more than Moulin Rouge, this reminded me more of, like, if you took that ten minutes in pan, where for ten minutes, out of nowhere, it was a musical like this where suddenly they're singing Blitzkrieg Bop and uh, yeah. Smells Like Teen Spirit. If you took that 10 minutes of pan and stretched it out, and <laughs> here's here's why this was a different sit than a lot of kids' movies you and I go see, mm -hmm. is that unlike Arctic Dogs or the you know, Ugly Dolls, something like that, this one is like a 15, 20 year labor of love project. And, and it, I will say this, it is so fucking weird for it. Yeah. That you cannot look away. Uh huh. Like this, this movie is proof to me that when Lucas dies, there's going to be so many books about this man. He's like the Howard Hughes of filmmaking, where you're like, what was going on in this guy's brain? Like, you were reading me trivia as we were watching it, and one of them was that, like, well, I made Star Wars for 12-year-old boys, and this is for 12-year-old girls. And you sat there and go, ladies, you got screwed. I said, yeah, I you, I'm like, ladies, you got hoes. Oh, my God. Um, it, it, this feels like, it, it. comparing it to, like, other Lucas things, this is like if you took those annoying, like, background CG characters from the Star Wars movies, like the burping frog or, or, or like, uh, mm -hmm. random things like that that would pop up in the background, and, like, this is a spinoff of just those characters <laughs> that would just be added <laughs> the, to the with background. With the Bog King sitting there with his little goblin yeah. friends, I'm like, wow... Jabba's palace really went downhill after he died. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can... You can feel... This is... It, it, it's in terms of its plot, in terms of its soundtrack, it is a lot of different things mixing of, together. Well, you said that... <laughs> you read that it was based on um, A Midsummer's Night's, Night's Dream, Dream I which, as I told you right away, I'm like, uh-oh. Because... Yeah. I, that, I don't even like that as a Shakespearean play. Like, I, you can call me uncultured swine all you want, but, like, I love a lot of Shakespeare. I actually don't like A Midsummer's Night Stream. It, so, and I was already like, but the plot to Midsummer's Night Dream is so complicated. I'm like, yeah. how are they going to do this? And then as I'm watching the movie, I'm like, all right, well, I get how they're going to do it. They're just going to make it needlessly complicated to the point that about the first half hour of the movie I had... No real idea what was going on, nor why I should give a shit. Okay, the first half hour of this movie. First half of this movie. First half, was, actually, yeah. Was reminding me, of it, this movie felt like a sequel. It felt like a bad animated <laughs> sequel. <laughs> where, the, the, the open, where the opening scene is the two characters mm -hmm. getting ready to get married. And I said to you, I go, I don't know who these two are. I go, I feel like this is the sequel, and in the first movie... 
they ended up together at the end of it. And what also made it feel like that is in a lot of animated uh, kids movie sequels, there's always several different plots going on because this character was popular in the first movie, so we need to give them their own thing that's, to do. No, you nailed it when you said that. Yeah, yeah it, it's like a... It's a it's, you know what fucking happened. You know what happened. Lucas had this story and he's like, well, this will all be explained in the prequel. And then you run in the <laughs> oh, right please. order and it all makes sense. Please make a prequel to this. I want to see more of fairy, this. Fairy Jar Jar is the key. <laughs> Hell, um, Lucas is animated into the movie. Not his voice, but like those, he's the fairy king in the movie. <laughs> because it's also, it's not just Midsummer Night's Dream. It's also Beauty and the Beast. And American yeah. Graffiti. It's and a beauty, Beauty and the Beast, American Graffiti, Midsummer Night's Dream. So uh, many. Midsummer's Night, whatever. <laughs> um, it, 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 several and the different weird thing movies. Is for for his, his statement about, like, this is the weird thing about Lucas. Like, I'll get into this statement a little, because he's like, Star Wars, I made for 12-year-old boys. He says that, and yet when I look at the original cut of Star Wars before his friends saved his ass, yeah. I'm like, there's so much weird political shit, and then you look at, like, Phantom Menace, which in some ways I do think makes a better kids movie. It's one of the reasons I like it better than Attack of the Clones, but yeah. still, there's... The, uh, must have a vote of no confidence and put Chancellor Palpatine. Mm. It's like, and like, kids don't follow any of that. And I'm like, he keeps claiming, like, I made it for 12-year-old boys. And yet there's all these weird allusions to, like, Kurosawa films. And I'm like, I feel like what happened here is that he originally made it, took it seriously enough, mm -hmm. got drunk on his own Kool-Aid, Shyamalan did, basically, got drunk on his own Kool-Aid, and he's like, yes, I am the great storyteller of our time. Because that was the thing in the 80s. Like, oh, this is the great storyteller. I am the myth maker. I make myths. I do this. And then when the prequels came out... And Phantom Menace tanked. And then you had, like, all of a sudden this change to, well, Star Wars was for 12-year-old boys. I don't see yeah. why people are upset. And I feel like he, he, like, was switching that around to cover his ass. Now they realize that, like, you know, nobody can take this shit seriously now. But I don't mm -hmm. think that was his original intention. Mm -hmm. But his claim is that he made Star Wars for 12-year-old boys, so he made this for 12-year-old girls. Which is weird because I feel like the female protagonist doesn't even do much of anything till about the halfway point of this movie. I'd say even after that. Like, because before then, it is structured like something like American Graffiti, where it's a bunch of different plot lines going there's on. There's so much stuff going on. Them like, if this is really for girls, there's, like, way too much stuff going on. Like, if you want to argue that Star Wars is for boys... Sure, you have a lot of, like, male characters running around. Though you do have... A female character who's got a lot of spunk, who's there in the beginning, like, mm. but I, I feel like Leia almost, like, kind of at least would, like, crop up a little more. Like, the, the main character in this one, she gets so lost for so long that when the, the movie, like, switches, and all of a sudden she has to go save her sister. Yeah. The second she goes into that forest... Like, with sword in hand, I'm like, why did it take us this long to get here? Yeah. This this feels like the heart of the movie right here. Not all no, this totally. other shit that we had to sit through yeah. with the stupid fucking songs for 40 fucking minutes. Like, right here, all of a sudden, I was, like, strangely invested. Now, maybe that was Stockholm Syndrome taking over, where I'm no, just, because like, then it actually so out of this movie that I'm identifying with it when it gives me something to chew on. Then it started actually having focus. Yeah. Like, because, um, because before then, it was... A lot of different movie. It was callbacks to a lot of different movies that weren't gelling together. Much like the soundtrack, because the soundtrack. It's oh not that. It's not soundtrack. that. It's like. It, it's not that the songs they. They're all covers, of course. But it's not like the original songs themselves are bad. They're not. There's a good collection of them in there. It's just. It's random. It's and, and it's not even. That, like, it is a jukebox, literally, in that if you just put it on shuffle. <laughs> sometimes it's country. Sometimes it's club music. Sometimes it's Motown. Like, we'll go from... Uh, I'm a little country. I'm a little rock and roll. Yeah. I'm a little Motown. Dude, <laughs> we'll go from, like, No Doubt to The Four Tops. Like, and yeah. it's... But lyrically, they're making sense to the action that's going on. Just in, in enough. 
Yeah, that was sometimes the other it's thing. a stretch. I also want to show this to Doug because I feel like Doug complains about like Moulin Rouge and the songs there. I'm like, I feel like Moulin Rouge did this way better. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, I it's been a while since I've seen that, but it, but in this, I, there wasn't ever really a point where I was thinking, context-wise, why are they singing this? Whenever they would pop up singing something, I was like, sometimes it was thin, like uh, anytime a song started, like this, the, this was the biggest problem with the movie. As I said, when when she goes into the forest, yeah, it suddenly clicked in. She like. They do this kind of Beauty and the Beast thing where yeah. she starts to fall for the villain. And they actually forge a connection. And I was kind of into it where I'm like, I'm actually seeing this as kind of like working. Like for about five minutes in this film, I'm like, I see what they're going for. Yeah. And they're executing it in a way that I'm like, this is almost charming. There were some jokes that actually kind of worked during that segment. Yeah. And then they start fucking singing again. Here's why I didn't have a problem with that. Because it what was a, strange, man. Because, yeah. yeah, I said to you at the beginning of this movie, I go, I am going to be, I love the song Strange Magic. Yellow is one of my favorite bands. So I go, if they don't sing Strange Magic in a jukebox musical called Strange Magic, I'm like, and that's I'm going to be pissed. That's probably not the best point to point it out, but it, it's my problem with the film is that whenever they're not singing, I feel like there might actually be a plot in there and there might actually be something that's not completely worthless. And when there's not... And then when they sing, it's like, the, the, there's just, there's no character to me. Nobody has any chemistry when they're singing. It's just no. throw some songs in. And then, like, you'd have these moments where I'm like, I'm kind of taking this seriously now. And then more songs. And also, if you dropped a lot of the... The, the type of jokes that this movie has is Ugh. something something awkward will happen, which will cause a character to go, awkward! Or, like, they'll say things like, your head is in the clouds. Clouds full of boys! <laughs> <laughs> so, like, way more often than not, the jokes don't work. This but movie. Um, I'll say this, like, in the... Le this is... It's rare that I see this happen so late in a movie, but when it got to the last half hour of this hour and 40 minute movies, it took an hour and 10 minutes for this movie to actually start having focus. And when it got to that last it half hour... It wasn't that bad. Yeah. It I, almost, I, I, I was, totally agree. It was kind of like sitting through Revenge of the Sith where you kind of cry a little and die a little inside because you're just like, this could have been something, yeah. maybe. Like That's you know, a good like, comparison. That's a really good comparison. Like the last, yeah, the last half hour of this, I'm like, I could see in Lucas's warped little grumpy uncle yeah. brain, like boomer brain, what maybe he was going for when he said like, I want to make this for my daughters. And like, yeah. it's about finding beauty on the inside, not the outside. It's not just about looking good. And like, cause the first half hour is watching this. I'm like, how, how is he, how is the story even going to get there? And by yeah. the end of it, I'm like, Okay, I I see where he been, was going. It should have been the whole movie instead of getting sidetracked on all of these different things. When it got to that again, that last half hour or so of the movie, I looked at you and I went, "I'm actually st now that it's settled down this late into the movie, I'm like, I'm actually starting to like a couple of these characters, the Alan Cumming character." It, it in a weird way, it fixes of all things. Who, who would have ever thought that I would say this? And like, I don't, I don't have a huge problem with with Beauty and the Beast. I think it's an amazing film. I don't have a problem with Frozen either. But there's nah. criticisms about those two movies, you know. And in a weird way, this movie tries to fix what some people consider problems with those. Yeah. And it nearly pulls it off if it could actually just fucking execute. Yeah. Because I'm like, man, the idea here is actually pretty good. Like. She has the impetus to go on her own quest. She goes to get her own sister back. Yeah. I don't feel like she doesn't fall in love with the character because she's been imprisoned. Like you can't mm -hmm. argue, you can't argue make the stuff like whether or not Belle has Stockholm. Y'all can argue that in the comments. I'm mm -hmm. not going to sit here and say she does. I'm just saying that's the criticism a number of people lob at that movie. You can't say that about this movie. No. Like it actually like does a good job of kind of fixing those those things that some people find problematic. <laughs> um, but it is so horribly executed in the way it does it that I'm like, no, this is terrible. I, I can't. Just... It's amazing how, like, it's like he comes so, like, Lucas comes so close in some steps and, like, 
20 steps backwards simultaneously. I'll never, like, yeah, there's going to be books written about him. Oh, totally. Uh, you know. Because, like, this is... Because this is insane. And yet there's also, there's, like, something going on here, too, at the same time. Where you're like, what what happened here? You can, you can tell by looking at a lot of the uh, imagery in it that it was mm -hmm. conceived that long ago. Because I said to you, I go, I could see this being in the vein of Willow Labyrinth, if this was made around that time period, and live action. That's where it belongs. Yeah. I think this, this movie may have played, you cut back on the craziness of the plot, this may have better played in the 80s. And Actually, the bad that, modern jokes that were in it. Yeah. It, it may have almost played better live action, if you found a way to do it, like Willow or Labyrinth with puppets, maybe. I could have seen it because being... Because it's got that look almost to it. Like, they're trying yeah. to go almost for a Dark Crystal kind of thing. And the it, legend. It doesn't work with this animation. The, the problem is the animation is both... It's too cheap to compete with Disney Pixar DreamWorks. Yeah. So, but it also looks a little too good to be, like, a direct-to-Netflix kind of thing, but it kind of feels closer to that. Mm -hmm. I was telling you, I think what they should have done, since this was a Lucasfilm project, they should have gone Clone Wars with it mm -hmm. and just gone hi cheaper but hyper-stylized. I think yeah. it might have pulled off better, but the the character design is so weird. We were saying they look like uh, the ants. Yeah. Yeah, and that um, works in ants. And then the villain like, looks like the villain from Bugs Life. Yeah, a giant yeah, yeah. locust kind of weird dragonfly kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. it, no, some of the monsters look like, or the look like they could have been prototypes for like Monsters Inc. or something like that. Like, yeah, uh, no, totally. Um, it, yeah, I, I could have seen it. I, I could have seen it being one of those movies like thirty five years ago that came out and bombed, but found a cult audience. Like if it, if I don't if know. Actually yeah, did it around then. I don't know if this one's gonna ever find that. Culture. No, I don't it's, think it's so. It, not in how it exists here. No, I don't. I don't see that at all. But if it had been made roughly around the time that yeah. the story was conceived, it's a little depressing because I, I, there are elements to the story I actually really like. This is a different. This kind is of... this is a lesser version of Onward. Oh, which yeah, had yeah. a few similar problems. Like at least for me, like I. The setting, I thought it got a little overly complicated for what it was trying to do, but I really liked the story. But Onward, I felt, like, succeeded way better. And, like, that yeah, that's one did. that I, I, I said, like, people should see it. Just go in expecting to get kind of sidetracked on things and not everything works. But this one, I, if this were out in theaters, I don't think I would tell people to see it. No, neither would I. Like, it'd be one where I'd be like, go the double to toasted route and have a drunk night watching it. <laughs> on like a this live stream. This is a great drug movie. Like, the but, ending alone, I'm just like, I turned to you, I'm like, did we drop shrooms? Oh, and like, it gets all kaleidoscope? Yeah. But no, like, what you said about Onward, um, in my case, it does have the benefit of being the first kids movie I saw after Homeward. The uh, Asylum <laughs> knockoff with Joey Lawrence. Because <laughs> here's the thing. About they should have just called it Downward. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Downward Spiral. Dude, yeah. Um, the thing about this movie is that it's one of those kids. It's it's different than like Arctic Dogs or some recent bad animated kids. Now, this was more interesting than Arctic Dogs. And, and it's and also I ambitious. I hated this movie maybe a little more just because the singing so got on my nerves. But yeah. I'm like, well, this was way more ambitious and interesting than something like Arctic Dogs. It is. Be. And because of that, it's like, well, okay, I respect it way more than I do Ugly Dolls or a movie like that. Hell, more than that live action Lion King that was out. Like this one's trying oh, that was to... one of the worst things I saw last year. Yeah. So. This one it's trying to have ideas. The problem is it has way too goddamn many of them. <laughs> Can we talk about the strangeness of first just Disney buys Lucasfilm out. Yeah. And then the director has to show up two Disney executives screen this and give a speech and pretty much like, this is Lucas's passion project and now and now you guys have it. And like, what do you think the Disney executives thought when they saw this? Do you think there was, there was just like silent, like internal screaming, just like they're all like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And inside they're just, ah! I, 
<laughs> I think they were. I think what they were probably thinking is one. We're putting this out in January, <laughs> and also maybe it could be a write off because like this. This may <laughs> this, this will be our, our our IRS uh, tax yeah, dodge because this thing had would you say a seventy million dollar budget? Seventy, according to Wikipedia, seventy to one hundred million dollars overall. Final gross on this because I don't think it's making money anymore. <laughs> yeah, is uh, I think it was thirty million. Thirty or thirteen? I thought it was thirty. Oh, okay. I and thought you said thirteen earlier. I was opening like, Damn. opening weekend. The Wikipedia was very keen to note this opening weekend five point five million. Yeah. Seventh in the country in January. Yeah. That opening weekend, and it holds the record as the worst animated film. For a box office return for an animated film that was released in more than 3,000 theaters. <laughs> and I think that calculation goes back to, they were saying, 1998. Yeah. So, impressive. Good job. It, 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 you could tell, because I... <clears throat> You could tell they maybe didn't have a lot of faith in this because I, I could be wrong, but I don't remember seeing that much advertisements for this movie. Would I spent the first forty minutes of this movie, like the fucking Adams family watching, you know the the stupid play. I was like Gomez and Morticia, just yeah. That was that was me literally mm. for forty minutes. Like, and I, that had to be. It was either that or I. I literally I caught myself at one point over there while you were watching it. I realized that for five minutes I was staring at the film like this. <laughs> I was for a lot. I was doing this a lot. <laughs> like, I was also thinking. And I got to imagine that's what the Disney executives are doing. They were just like, what? I was also thinking, oh, Laura's going to regret taking a nap. She's going to wish you were here watching this. <laughs> Why don't we. I want to mention the director. Cause this oh, is, yeah, yeah. This is so weird. So the director was basically one of Lucas's, like, ILM or, or, or film, Lucasfilm's, like, audio engineers. Yeah. Worked on a number of great, like, Jurassic Park, Star Wars movies. A this ton, a ton of, like, Oscar-nominated movies. And basically was just handed a film to direct. Mm. Why? <laughs> like I am not and this guy is he's a huge talent. I am not I am not knocking his skills in audio engineering, but why do you go to an audio engineer, somebody who does like mostly audio work in movies and go like you're my guy to direct this major animated motion picture? I think he had done he had directed a short before this. Is that why? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I want to say he directed an animated short. Because I saw this. the only other two directing credits I saw were for basically ADR work in a couple of like Miyazaki movies. Yeah. Which is fine. And I'm not saying he may have done those perfectly. I, I remember the dubs in those movies. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they seem fine. But the, there's a difference between like directing some voice actors to redub a movie and you are the director of an entire animated film. You know, like, you, you are the, the John Lasseter, kind yeah. of, um, it, it, or the, uh, why am I blanking? The it's guy like, uh, Ratatouille. Iron Giant. Uh, oh, oh, uh, Brad Bird? Brad Bird, thank yeah. you. I don't know why my brain just shut off for a second. There. <laughs> happens a lot, folks. Um, mine almost did. I, mine almost <laughs> did. In my head, I was like, "Please be right. Please be right." Um, but it, it's just so it's just so weird. Now, mm -hmm. to to his credit, I get totally why he said yes. Because if I were in a similar scenario, I would be, "Why the hell not?" I'm sitting here, I do nothing but audio work, and mm. I'm amazing, I'm awesome at it, but literally George Lucas comes up to me and says, I want you to direct this animated film. If it doesn't yeah. work, I go right back to my awesome audio career, like, I'm just like, yeah. like, and that's what or happened. Or you say like, no like, and go do Dune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody knew, <laughs> nobody knew or cared about this movie. I think yeah. this guy's career is just possibly fine, so I'm not blaming him, I'm just like... You go, buddy. That's the Roger that was, Christian uh, thing. Know. With like Roger Christian was like a, a cinematographer for Lucas and did Battlefield Earth. And yeah. in both in both this and Battlefield Earth, they do the uh, the Star Wars wipe. I think, 
Honestly, I think in some ways Roger Christensen came out a little better because that movie has such infamy attached to it. You're right. This one, there's no, no really there's talks no about infamy. This. I think it's because it's not quite bad enough. Yeah, it is really bad and and ill. It, ill-conceived by trying to do the jukebox musical thing. I think that's a lot of what wrecks it. Yeah. It would be more bland, but it, it, that wrecks so much of this. Cause it's what made it memorable for me, for better or worse. Yeah, like, but it's definitely for worse, because at at, we were talking about that scene where, like, the villain and the, the heroine are actually connecting. Yeah. And I'm like, I turned to you, and I'm like, can you imagine how much better this scene would play it was playing all right for us, but how much better would it have played if we had actual character development earlier in this yeah, movie instead no, of just totally. random fucking songs? Because mm -hmm. even some of the jokes are kind of working in that scene. Like, like timing suddenly got better yeah. with some of the jokes. When it, he opens the door and it's just the quick that, burst of... That was one of, like, there were, like, maybe two or three scenes in the movie where I laughed. That one I read... Yeah. Yeah. So I was telling you, I'm just like, wow, did we have comic timing there for, like, yeah. ten seconds? The part like, with the cricket. Yeah, uh, the the cricket was the best freaking joke in the thing. Yeah. And I laughed and I laughed hard. And then I started laughing like more and more like a crazy person <laughs> because I realized that what I was laughing at was the fact that I actually laughed at a joke in this movie. Like, Don't I you hate for, it when that happens? I know, I was just like, I was kind of like, <laughs> and then I started going like, <laughs> you're like, what's so funny? I'm like, I just realized I'm laughing at a joke in this movie yeah. that's making and me And it was like now. an hour, because those kind of laughs you get yeah. whenever you haven't laughed for like an hour of the movie, like at all, from beginning to an hour in, the, and then you get that one. The joke, by the way, folks, is that they're they're in an enchanted forest and they're all like small little fairy creatures and butterflies or whatever and then one of the characters suggests doing something he's like you know who's with me or whatever and you just hear this cricket chirping and you'd think it would just be the sound effect of a cricket chirping but then the camera pans down there's a giant cricket mm. like about the half the size of one of the characters who just like looks like oh and then like slinks back and i was just like and it was timed perfectly i'm like there it is one really funny joke in this movie that i just started yeah. laughing and couldn't stop and even like later towards the end where alan cummings character was having to do like romantic things and stuff like that like how he suddenly likes yeah. that little like flower <laughs> lapel that he has then you, there I would be moments of, like that like, him. like I, yeah I was liking him. I was starting to like her. Like the both, all the characters in this movie had no personality, were borderline insufferable. Yeah. But those two, somewhere in the middle of the movie, like switch around when they tried to tell a goddamn story mm -hmm. and sat there and actually like had interactions and dialogue and shared feelings and emotions that didn't involve fucking singing some song from yeah. 1996. Like it, it, it worked. Yeah. Would you would you say this is worth like a one of those nights where you get together and watch a movie like this? Like like, like you have friends together if and musicals did musicals don't bother you, sure. Yeah, like if you like have that's the problem for me is it. like I if I don't like a musical, it really is like pulling teeth for me. I it's insufferable. I can't yeah. stand it. So all of the song sequences in this I couldn't stand. Mm -hmm. When they paused for a second, like, honestly, I was kind of getting a little into it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Like, this is one of those where your mileage will vary. That's, I've it had will. to say that a lot lately because, like, we're in a world where it's like, if you don't absolutely love something, how dare you? Makes and then you it's like, it. okay, well, I do like it. How dare you? It's like, okay, fine, your mileage may vary. I feel maybe that's fair. Like, so I... It just depends, I guess, what what you're looking for. It's it's not a good movie. No, there's, it's not at all. There's some gems of there's like some gems of some good ideas in there. I don't know what people think of this. I have seen a couple people out there in chats when we when Doug and I do stuff defend the movie yeah. and say they really like it. And I think I, I kind of get it in a weird way. I do too, where I'm like, I can see where you're coming from. It's it's not good, and I'm it's like, unique. but I. Yeah, um, and I get, and the message is actually really good. Yeah, kind of like the message is what Disney only really was starting to do recently. Mm -hmm. Like, if this is really what George Lucas like, this is a shame. If this is what George Lucas really wanted to tell fifteen years ago, or, or I mean, fifteen years before the movie was released, when did mm -hmm. this come out? Two thousand fifteen. So if this is a movie that George Lucas wanted to do in the year 2000, uh -huh. 
fucker would have been ahead of his time. Because, I mean, the message would have been, like, kind of a slap in the face to a lot of Disney films. This would have this would have been, like, seen as kind of one of the DreamWorks films. Now, that's no guarantee because it still would have been George Lucas. We saw The Phantom Menace. And yeah. Still could have been a disaster. But the story idea itself the woman actually falls would in have love seen with, ahead of its time. The woman falls in love with who starts out as the kind of gross two-dimensional villain. Again, like you said, something you'd see in, like, A Bug's Life or a movie like that. And the kind... Cause, because it's also sort of an Elvis movie, the country prince or whatever, who yeah. at first you think is the love interest, but then isn't, and you find out really quickly that Just he's like not. Frozen did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did Frozen come out before this or after? This was 2015. So I guess that would have been before. I think, I want to say this came out after? Oh, no, I, I mean Frozen came out before. This, oh, so. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think so. Um, I, I'm, willing this was give, a, I'm, will, I'm willing to give Lucas the benefit of the doubt and say that he had this idea as a story. I want to say this was around that movie Epic, and honestly, I found this to be an easier sit than Epic. Um, <laughs> no, I feel like, yeah, maybe he sat on this. He, he sat on this too long. I think everybody else beat him to the punch. But man, if, if this had come out like this idea... Mm -hmm. As he claims that this was his idea in 2000, this was this this we'd be looking back on this going like, eh, this movie really was ahead of its time. Even <laughs> it was executed, so like, it really could have been a cult. Yeah, film. instead, instead, yeah. now that it's come out, everybody was comparing it to Frozen, and it's like maybe that's fair, maybe it's not. Like maybe it did you had because Lucas is so in his own bubble mm -hmm. sometimes, and I'm like, I don't know if he would have looked at Frozen. It's like ah, I'm gonna put this in my movie, like. That implies he even saw Frozen. I'm not yeah. convinced of that. Like, <laughs> this is a guy who was convinced he had made like the first like movie with a, an African American cast. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, he's so in his own world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's too unique for me to just be like, oh, whatever. I'm, I'm not even saying to see it. It's just more like th this is. This is this turned out different than I thought it was going to be going yet. Again, I wasn't expecting a jukebox musical out of it, but all told, when it was all said and done, for me, I'm like, it's enough, it, it stands out enough as a bad movie to be like, it is one of those where if you have some people and have some drinks together, you could, you could watch this, and you telling me that it seemed... To actually kind of have some people who defend it. That, that I've doesn't seen surprise me. because Very of, few. Because again. But I've seen you it know, does a few. stand out from movies like Epic or something that would just be it is, wildly forgettable. It is a Shyamalan movie. Yeah. Like I'll <laughs> yeah. say this about Shyamalan movies. Like even the worst ones I'm like alright I have never seen that before. Lady in the Water. Yeah it's kind of yeah. what this is. <laughs> um, the, 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 maybe this is Lucas's yeah. Lady in the Water. I don't. Any final thoughts about the movie? It's right. <laughs> My only final thought is this. When the yeah. movie stopped, the end credits stopped, I said I felt like Krusty the Clown on The Simpsons just with yeah. the cigarette in hand. Just, yeah. What the hell was that? <laughs> you do got to appreciate a, a bad musical, though, that actually includes its own reference to George C. Scott in hardcore. There is a character in it who goes, turn it off! Because you know, it's funny because that's what I was thinking throughout the whole movie. So, the 12 year old girls love Paul Schrader's hardcore. <laughs> it was good of Lucas to put that it's in. So <laughs> weird. Like, I don't, I, the funny thing is, I wouldn't have even thought of this as a quote unquote girls movie so much. There happens to be Me neither. fairies in it. Yeah. But otherwise, I just would have thought of this as more your generic, like, Kids fantasy. Yeah. Then it, I don't know. Then again, I, I guess maybe Star Wars is a boys movie. I just considered Star Wars more like you know, kids of any age. Oh, we had the Burger Chef tie-ins for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I just figured you you could be any age or gender and watch it. Like, yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anymore. Just what the hell was that? <laughs> I. Well, again, thank you so much, Delta Septi, for yeah for for, for requesting this for us. I think I think I would have rather you describe this to me. I wouldn't have been <laughs> sick through it. I know we. <laughs> We don't have access to the studio right now, so we it's don't. like, I this can't is... just describe this movie to you. We're on quarantine. Yeah. You, you, my friend, have entered the inner circle. Because you are one of, like, only, like, I think seven people I have any human contact with. 
Nice. Because You're regretting that now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, and I'm completely regretting it. No, yeah. it's you and Laura, mm -hmm. Doug and uh, Doug and his wife, my own wife, mm -hmm. and then my dad. Yeah. Because um, all my, like, I would have One my... One of the Magnificent Seven. I would have all my friends over Wednesday night to watch stuff, and that yeah. would be, like, seven or eight people here, and we're just, like, not going to risk it, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Congrats. Yes. <laughs> I hooray! Made. Hooray for me! I caused all this just to enter, this, just to be in the inner circle. Well, it's because you live right down the hall, so. <laughs> no, no, I want. I want to feel special. Damn it! I brought you strange magic. Well, and then Doug and I like. Well, that's the thing. You and I have to work, and then yeah. Doug and I have to work. Like, yeah. pretty much the only people I have any contact with are people I work with. Yeah. So. Um, this was work. <laughs> in a lot of ways, this was. <laughs> so if you want if you want to request some more uh click on the link in the description in the comments it's patreon Please be gentle the next couple are some good ones so it's patreon.com slash the cinema snob and thank you very much guys